Hi, I'm Andrew. I am Giacomo. And welcome to Kimi and the Lost Voice Devlog, an adventure platformer where you play as a tiny dog that punches with its voice in a 2D hand-drawn whimsical world where the sun and the moon have stopped moving. We have a Steam page open. It would really mean a lot if you could head over there and give us a wish list. But anyways, let's get straight on to the devlog. So, for the past few weeks, I've been working on the cleanup of the characters. We now have most of the animations of Pinny, the trumpet boar, and the winning design of a drum band from the last devlog's poll in full color. We received messages from people asking about the animation process, from the sketch of the character to the final cleanup. After I make different sketches of the design and I'm happy with its appearance, I then make a drawing of how it should look in game as a reference guide for the animation process. I then create a new file in TV Paint with a canvas about four times bigger than what the exported image is going to be like when I shrink it in the export window according to the pixels per unit number we chose. This allows me plenty of room for drawing precise lines and adding details. So I make a rough pass of the animation, not caring too much about the consistency of the lines or shape of a character, but trying to get a good feeling of the movement and timing. At this stage, it's important to see if the animation works well in-game, especially the interactions between the player and the enemies. I improve anything that wasn't working too well in the second pass, in which I also put everything more on model, so that it's compatible for cleanup. I make good use of the reference image and the onion skin, which lets me look at the ghost of the previous frames, and also move and rotate them around without touching the proper frames. I use the onion skin to draw highlights and shadows too. When that is done, we can finally start the cleanup. To keep the lines consistent, it's a matter of drawing clean lines Lines, starting from the keyframes, which are the key poses of the action, then the frame in the middle of two keyframes, with the onion skin on, and then the frames in the middle of the frame and the keyframe, and so on. In such a way, I can always make sure the lines I'm drawing are always consistent with the others. Working on Tatful Tales made me realize how much different animation for game is compared to animation for other media. In games, player feel is the most important thing, and some animation principles kind of work against that. One of the principles of animation is anticipation, which is the pre preparation pose a character makes before performing an action. And in the case of jumping, the anticipation would be bending the legs to then release them and jump up like a spring. In a platformer game, having anticipation played when the player presses the jump button means there is going to be a delay between the input and the proper action, which is going to feel sluggish. This is why there is little to no anticipation in the animations of Pinny. If you're interested to know more about this, there is a very interesting GDC talk from Skullgirls animator Mario Cartwright. Link in the description. So after working on the basic player movement and attacks, it is time for me to implement something that I have been thinking about for a long time, and that is player stamina. Stamina bars in games usually act as a limit gauge, which basically is to limit players' ability to do a repeated action. Stamina bars were largely pioneered by Secret of Mana, and were later on adopted by a number of action RPGs, including Kingsfields, Souls games, and Neo. My initial idea with stamina bars is to restrict players to use special abilities where the player is not incentivized to use them as frequently as, let's say, basic combat. For now, that special ability is just Bark Jump but we will see if there are more spaces to add. I really like the bark jump idea, not because of only how cute the flip animation Giacomo made, but also because it is really useful for both traversal and combat, making Pini a lot more acrobatic. Here's a crappy GIF I made to help you visualize how charging bar actually works. And the dots on the top left are points that consume bark jumps. Note that the bars won't actually be visible in the game, and the length or duration of the bar can be adjusted in such a way so it can feel organic and natural. I'm not 100% sure if this is a good addition, but only time and lots of playtesting will tell. Last time, we discussed the process of making the tile sets, and we realized they are not really the best they could be in order to be used in the game. We tried setting them as rule tile sets and things got complicated pretty quickly. It turns out that the little tuft of grass I mentioned last time actually did more harm than solve the issue because it added more complexity to the tile set rule, almost tripling its rule size. And so we had to reconsider the wall structure or otherwise place each single tile one by one. A good solution should be moving the drawings inside the tiles around in such a way I can add this tile that would connect the slopes in the opposite way. Moreover, we received some feedback regarding the look of the tile sets, highlighting that at this stage it's not super clear where you can or cannot walk on. I'm thinking of reworking the highlights of the grass so that the walkable surface looks much more visible. 
Truly, I can say that making an organic tile set can be really tricky, but I'm still super confident that we'll manage. Speaking of organic looking levels, I recently got to play John's Biogun, which is a super cool and exhilarating metroidvania game set inside the body of a dog. As a designer, I will always try to enrich my library of game references, and I have to say, Biogun's level design is really well thought out. They have a demo, and it's completely free. I highly suggest you check them out. Apart from stamina, I worked on the enemy AI. While I have been playing around with behavior designer for quite a while, I realized that I wasn't fully utilizing the behavior tree as it's supposed to be to its full potential. The designs I made were so restrictive that I couldn't apply the same things to other variations of enemies. So I took a step back and started researching more about behavior trees and the differences between them and finite state machines. One of the main advantages that made me decide to use behavior trees over a finite state machine is because of how flexible it is. For instance, if you want to change the state execution order of an FSM, you would have to change the inner depths of the transitions between the states. With behavior trees on the other hand, you don't have to worry about the transitions and it's super easy to just change, edit, rearrange and create a new AI logic for different situations. For more information, there is this awesome video made by Dominic Hackle recreating the false knight boss fight using behavior trees, link in the description. Now with that in mind, I spent a decent amount of time brainstorming and thinking about all the possible types of enemies, and by type I don't mean their names, the location, the zones that they're in, I mean strictly mechanic. Some of them that I came up with are really crazy and probably won't even be in the game, but I had to make sure that I would squeeze every single bit of enemy ideas I had just to make sure. From there, I started building each aspect of the enemy behaviors one by one, from just enemy turning from one direction to another, to charging towards the player. The beautiful thing about this is that I can now use this for any type of enemies as each task is customizable and not dependent on the enemy type, which was something that my previous scripts couldn't do. Check out this bat chasing behavior for example. I know it might look a bit messy, but let me explain. The red circle is the detection area for the bat while the bat is patrolling. If the player enters the red circle, the bat will start chasing them. While during the chase, the magenta circle is active and if the player leaves the magenta circle, the bat will then return back to patrolling which is the sign square zone. And finally, while the drum bat is chasing the player, if the drum bat exits the green square, it will return back to the patrolling area as well. I can rearrange its size, chasing speed, and almost every single aspect of the AI actions, and most importantly, I can simply apply them to other enemies as well, and they would work just fine. I'm very happy with how they turned out so far. Oh, I also applied inheritance to the task scripts. I can say that Benji is very proud of me, as every time I tried to do inheritance before, somehow I always managed to fail. But something just clicked this time. And now, it's time for a new poll. Which butt color do you like more? A or B? If so, why? Let us know why you like them in the comments below and vote on our Discord to help us decide which one to put in our game. Now, in my life this week, I got to wear the Akatsuki jacket with Megumi on stream. Streaming game dev and chatting with you guys has been really fun for me, so thank you guys so much for being there. I've been playing a little bit of Fortnite with Seb and damn, without building, I feel like it's a different game. Seb also invited me to this really nice gin tonic place in Bucharest called Ginoteca. The bartender were super nice, the place was super cozy and I enjoyed a very nice mango gin. From my side, I've been enjoying the beginning of spring with nice walks at sunset, my favorite time of the day during spring and summertime. I recently finished reading 20th Century Boys by Naoki Urasawa. I really enjoyed it for its themes and memorable characters. I was already a fan of Monster and I can't wait to start reading the other works of this amazing artist. We have some new awesome fan arts to show you. Here we have Dapper Dog, Doomtons, Matt1556 and Random Rock with these amazing reinterpretations of Ping. Thank you so, so much for this. We love them. And that's all for this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please consider giving us a like and subscribe to be part of our journey. You can support us by wishlisting the game on Steam. And with that being said, I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye! bye, -bye. Will our adventurers be able to overcome the challenges of game dev? Find out more on our next episode of Pokey. I mean, Penny and the Lost Voice Devlog.